and that means you can keep looking at the full trajectory and you can observe the full trajectory which means you can do your observation and then your statistical analysis which is the bottom part of this slide in the same way without having to reduce your data first before you then do your analysis. So you can actually allow for non-directed hypotheses. You no longer have to set that reduced hypothesis, which was probably set after you've done an overall observation of your data. Um, so you can actually do that in the first place. The second thing is that you can present your data in a non-abstract way. You don't have to go into a table because if you plot the graph, which is for example this 1D graph, the actual data is shown and the statistical inference is shown with the graph. So you can see here for this particular data on a sagittal plane flexion extension angle in the knee, I, I believe, during a certain type of locomotion, we have two conditions that we compare. And we can see straight away that there is a certain zone um, in the initial impact and, or in the initial phase and then around about the middle of the phase there's another zone where we can see that there is statistical uh, difference between the two curves. And you can present it that way. You don't have to reduce your data by saying that ah, that peak zone there will only present that data. The same thing is with foot pressures. If you go to the two-dimensional analysis, then you can see that with foot pressures you can actually showcase differences between populations by color coding the pressure. So what you do here is you don't see an actual pressure, but you can see the zones in red that will have one population which shows less pressure than the other population, whereas the zone in blue, for example, is a population that shows more pressure than the other population. So that's where you can see visually very clearly what is happening without having to reduce your data to peak values or zones that were artificially determined. And finally, with 3D data, you can do the same. So hopefully you can see that here, this is a comparison between two types of stresses on this bone. The blue data, again, shows shows reduced pressures, the red data shows increased pressures, so you can clearly see where the changes in pressures are without having to look at this very complicated graph, graphical abstract representation. And SPM allows to handle smooth and bounded data. Well, this is this principle that this pot of paint, it's not just a random image that you see there with random dots on it. It's actually smooth and bounded to an extent. But the question then is, how does it deal with? Well, that's rather complicated to explain in full detail, but I'll try to explain the principle. So here we go with random field theory in a very brief one minute um, presentation. So random field theory manages to handle with the issue that you are doing multiple comparisons and statistical inference with this bounded and smooth data. And how it does that, I'll explain it by something that um, Todd Pataki, uh, who I will have to acknowledge uh, very greatly at the end of this presentation, um, has explained very well in one of an appendix of um, a paper that we're publishing now at the moment. Uh, and on the left-hand side, the curve shows totally uncorrelated data. That means that each data point is a random data point that is not correlated to the data point before and the data point after. So that means that we have there 100 data points that are totally independent. So what you really need to do there is you need to correct for doing 100 independent t-tests if you do a comparison of data there. The middle one has been smoothed. Yeah, it has been smoothed to a certain extent, which means that to an extent you don't have 100 independent tests anymore, but you have less independent tests to an extent. And it's easier to explain if you go to infinitely smooth data. So infinitely smooth data is a straight line in the end. That's, that's actually smoothed to the maximum extent that you could ever imagine. And that means if you have a straight line, you only have to do one test anymore. So the middle curve sits somewhere in between 100 independent tests and correcting for that and only doing one test. So it sits somewhere in between and so random field theory allows us to deal with that principle. So it comes up with a 
t-test value, for example, and inference related to that, based on a correction, based on this principle of randomness or based on the principle of smoothness and how these are associated to each other. Yeah? So that's the principle of random field theory, which is the underlying mechanism to deal with these data in SPM. And so when we then have the next slide, uh, you can see a T curve, which means we have a T value, which normally is a single value for discrete analysis. Now we have a T curve because we keep time in our um, parameters. And in the bottom part of the slide, you can see that we can then also, from that t-curve, set a threshold value, which now sits there around about 3 in this case, based on inference of what is, according to our principles of statistics, meaningful. And you can then identify for certain areas a particular value of statistical inference, which is your p-value that we all refer to, right? But you don't have to do that for independent points because that zone that you see there, around 50%, that zone, they are actually bound to each other. So you can calculate, based on random field theory, a p-value for that zone. That's where you show how important that zone is, crossing that uh, threshold value. So there's the background theory of random fields. And now we go to the applications. So I hope that people are still online. Uh, Bart? Yeah. Uh, Rul? Yeah. Sabine? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so, statistical parametric applications. So how does this be, how is this put in place then? Well, this is put in place in exactly the same way as what we um, use for discrete values. So you could consider discrete value statistical analysis as 0D data, zero dimensional data. Well, what we do is we just expand into one dimensional, two dimensional, and three dimensional data. And so we use the same types of tests. So our terminology is the same. So what I'm going to demonstrate today is three types of tests. First of all, a T test, which um, is uh, currently a paper that is under revision. Then uh, regression analysis, so linear regression in this case. And then an ANOVA test. And the future is then towards these more complicated uh, tests that you tend to have. So that could be Ankova, Mankova, Manova, uh, and etc., etc. And that's why we're working on that. And I'll explain one particular aspect of that uh, uh, in what we had as our uh, vector field paper. So let's go to an application. Let's first go to SPM T test. And I will restrict all the applications for today to one dimensional data just to understand the principle. So what we have there is we have knee moments at the top of this slide and we have two groups of knee moments. So if we have two groups that we want to compare or if it's repeated measures then we have a paired comparison t-test or either a paired t-test or an independent t-test. So we can actually now do this and what you see there at the top is two curves with their means and standard deviations associated to it. What do people typically do? The, the yellow and the blue dots, that's what people typically will take from it and then analyze that as a discrete value. We don't have to do that anymore with statistical parametric mapping because if we now look at the bottom um, of the of the slide, then you can see that we now identify where there are potentially differences between these two curves. And you can see that it's only in the frontal plane that there is a substantial difference there. You can see it's at a p-value of less than 0 0.001, so it's a very large um, probability that this is a meaningful difference between these curves. But if you had to try and, without this technique, observe from these curves where the differences are, it would have been very difficult to do that. So what are the steps that you take? You do your, you set your T value, and that's your T curve basically, that you identify. Then you set the threshold value for your statistical inference and then you try to see where the actual uh, difference is and you can also see that there is an upwards threshold value for if one group is bigger than the other and there's a downwards threshold value for if that group was smaller than the other. 
Yeah? So that's how you interpret these statistics. Um, if there are any questions, then we can come back to this at the end of the presentation. Next slide. Statistical parametric mapping. How do we do linear regression? Well, this is from our paper on uh, approach speed in uh, side cutting maneuvers. So what we have is the top left curves, uh, all the curves, indicate a knee moment in the frontal plane over time of the stance, so stance phase, and you can see it's normalized, so it's registered to 100 data samples all. And what we have is the grayscale allows us to indicate which of these curves was at which velocities that the person was running. So what you have is you have a variation in those curves dependent on the speed at which they are running. Now it's very difficult to see that here, but what we can then uh, calculate is what we call a beta curve which is our regression curve basically, so it's a beta value that we calculate now to identify how the speed is explaining the variation in those curves at every point in time. So at each point in time we get a value and that's the bottom curve on the slide on the left is actually the value you see reaches up to about 15 in that initial 20% of the contact phase. That curve is calculated for one individual. So we have one individual that runs at different velocities. So what we then need to do is we need to do that for each individual. So if I now go to the next um, graph on the top uh, right hand side, that graph shows the same curve in bold that we've just shown. So the same curve of that individual the beta curve is now shown in bold. You see it's, it's smaller but actually it's, it reaches up to 15 um, and that's that curve. So you do that for all your subjects which are all these other curves and then you can calculate your TSPM statistics. So that's where statistically now we have identified for all these curves where there is a particular level of variation in the knee joint moment that is explained by speed. And you can again do statistical inference by setting a threshold value, so you need to set that threshold value, an upwards and a downwards, and you can see that in this case speed is positively correlated significantly in the first impact phase or the first uh, deceleration phase of that um, um, curve. So that's what you have there. Now, does this have to mean that you don't do your typical data analysis anymore? It doesn't have to mean that because we actually in this paper um, applied also the discrete analysis and that's the next uh, graph that pops up which is literally just what typically people typically do. So they have the different velocities, 2, 3, 4 and 5 meters per second. You plot that as a bar, you identify the peak loading which happened during that phase that was meaningful actually. You identify the peak loading and you see with speed it goes up. What we identified was that during 2 and 3 meters per second there was insufficient loading to observe but then eventually got really high loading so we actually um, were able to use this combined analysis from using statistical parametric mapping and the old-fashioned, sorry, the, the, uh, the other um, analysis of discrete values to come up with a standardized uh, speed for uh, doing our observations.